more here on the digital picket line uh, for this GSEP organized teach-in on labor in architecture. Um, we first want to send our love to the in-person picket. You're all doing an incredible work out there and um, we're so um, happy to be in this with you together, even if we are doing the digital um, version of the picket line here. Um, we are very grateful to our speakers who have agreed on such short notice to join us for today's discussion. Um, and we're also happy to see um, so many familiar and also unfamiliar faces here, or rather Zoom squares. Um, we are looking forward to just having a really lively discussion today. Um, this teaching is focused on questions of unionization in the academy and the professional practice. practice. And while it's titled labor in architecture, these struggles and efforts in the architectural world are part of a larger conversation on precarious labor and exploitative work environments. So I think they speak to um, an, an audience that is larger than GSEP and larger than Columbia. Our aim is to connect our labor struggles as graduate workers to that of adjunct faculty, as well as larger unionization drives in the design and building industries. Adjunct faculty at Columbia GSEP and at other institutions, similar institutions, are often in even more precarious positions than we as graduate students. The professional practice to which most GSEP graduates move on to similarly exhibits highly exploitative working practices. The professional school is a pivotal element in the system of precarious labor and in the fight against it. This teaching hopes to foster a conversation that will bring the shared efforts to unionize amongst graduate students, adjunct faculty, and architectural workers into focus and establish lasting solidarity across different groups within and outside the academy. Um, we put together a file that includes a Google Doc link that includes um, a list of links, publication, articles, books, reading lists, and further resources on the topic. And I think Elliot is about to drop that into the chat. Um, so please feel free to have a look at that. Um, to save time, we also decided to paste the bias of our speakers into the chat um, and just give a very brief collective introduction here. Um, and I think Elliot is also going to do that. Thank you. Uh, to save some time. Um, yeah, so um, just for a quick collective intro, um, all of our speakers are educators, organizers, and activists in different realms from academic spaces and the professional practice to the intersection of those and further non-institutional spaces. And I think we'll talk some more about the specifics of these spaces and their interaction with each other. They all have backgrounds in architecture, design, and or architectural has history. Um, and yes, you can find their bios in the chat now. Um, Eyal, Esther, Shumi, Jerome, Chalisa, Lexi, Todd, and Shota, welcome and thank you for being here. So um, we will just start with a round of uh, short input statements and then um, dive right into the discussion. Um, Eyal, do you wanna start us off? Um, I could, but it might make sense for me to go after other people speak, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't want to call on anybody. Who wants to start? Do I need to call? I need to call. Okay. Um, Shota. Uh, yes, uh, you got me. I guess I can. Uh, I can't Thank you. escape now. Um, well, first of all, just this is like incredible to see. I'm like always amazed at like um, strike energy and these kinds of events. And so like, um, I don't know, I know the digital picket's been going like far beyond the specific event. Um, so I just want to like shout out to all of the strike workers and all of the organizers involved. Um, okay, so I, I, um, I, I wasn't really sure what the format of this was going to be. So I just have some general things that I want to say. Um, but, but basically my background um, is like in a little bit, uh, a little bit ago, I was sort of in architecture, like professional work and in landscape architecture. And for the past 
uh, three years, I've been um, doing a PhD program where my organizing has uh, largely shifted to uh, academic workers with UIW 2865, which is uh, the sibling local to UL 2110 uh, for University of California campuses. Um, so yeah, so uh, lots of solidarity from, from our end. Uh, but I think uh, what I was hoping to maybe talk about today, just like in bringing architecture organizing world and academic organizing world together, um, are just like uh, maybe like this kind of shared problem of uh, of organizing professional workers, which sort of has its own like history and like set of difficulties attached, um, and like some kind of common strategies that I think are really really important to both. Uh, some of which I imagine like has have you know y'all have heard like kind of ad nauseum throughout these events, but I think are really kind of worth hammering home. Um, you know, like the power of one to one organizing and like collective action and stuff like that. Um, but so I think the kind of cornerstone um, for the lobby's approach to this and uh, in a big way, like our, uh, our grad student workers union has been to like really uh, like instill kind of a like a consciousness of uh, professionals as workers, right? So like academics as workers, grad students as workers, which like isn't really the, the first place where people's uh, minds go. Uh, but like that's been like a shift that we've had to really kind of carefully negotiate. Um, so for instance, like, uh, in architecture, this is kind of really clearly meant like um, like pushing back against the suggestion that like the power of architects sort of um, in a social capacity um, and in a political capacity comes from their agency as architects, right? So like, um, you know, what we all learn in architecture education is that like you learn to design solutions for problems. And if we see problems at kind of uh, the scale of social relations and politics, we can like design our way out of them. Um, and so we say, Nope, um, the power that we should be kind of going after um, in these uh, instances is our power as workers, right? So our ability to withhold labor, um, like uh, you all are doing at Columbia amazingly right now, uh, but basically our power as uh, as like agents in uh, in class relations and in sort of um, the like the economic formation of architecture, right? So um, we shouldn't believe that like our job is to come up with better ideas uh, or like you solutions that no one's ever heard of because there are plenty of like good ideas um but that like the kind of organizing objective is to reveal how it's like class relations that stand in that way and how collective um action and collective bargaining can um make that kind of change happen much more easily um and like realistically than the sort of individual efforts of a designer for instance and i think for academics sometimes this um plays out in some similar way where um, there's a sense that like you can kind of have a radical practice, which is and like people are kind of doing amazing things in that sphere. So I don't want to, um, I, I don't mean to to, to critique anyone, uh, but specifically for kind of like um, union organizing and for uh, for like the questions of labor, um, it's really like our sort of position in the economic kind of structure of the university that like gives us that leverage. Um, so, uh, so the kind of big question I think um, that we always come back to both in our union and in the architecture lobby uh, has been sort of how to like really convey that to folks um, and um, a large part of it has been through um, like, like, you know, uh, through publications and through kind of um, large scale programs and uh, sort of like events, uh, but uh, one like really kind of critical strategy is one to one organizing and like this is um, like will be familiar to those of you. Um, who have kind of backgrounds in the in the labor movement, uh, but like, you know, no shortcuts, right? Like there's no way around uh, communicating to all, communicating with all workers and kind of getting majority buy-in from as many folks um, as you can. So uh, like one-on-one -on -one organizing means like building power um, all throughout the workplace and sort of using this as a basis for kind of democratic practice, right? So like um, in, I, I recall a, a campaign last spring that we had where you know, there were like some really difficult departments to organize that like didn't have a lot of buy-in from uh, from the union. And, you know, there were like folks saying things like, oh man, like some people are just like harder to organize. They're like, not as like, you know, with it. Um, but actually, no, that's like, I really kind of um, disagree with that sentiment. And I think like sort of a robust kind of stewardship structure and like uh, an approach based on like one-on-one -on -one organizing really shows that like, if people aren't reacting to what you're trying to organize for, then it's sort of, um, something that needs to be uh, addressed at the, at the level of organizing, right? So like, if you can't buy it, get buy-in, that's not their problem, that's the problem of the movement. Um, so, you know, this is the way I think, this is like a really good way to kind of work across that, um, 
question of like professionals identifying as workers. Um, and uh, it's it's sort of something that like, you know, really doesn't like take a lot of resources. It just takes uh, sort of time and uh, like, uh, in, like uh, instances of small scale organization that like can build up into uh, like a larger scale. So, you know, one by one by one is what we always say. Um, and so what's really exciting um, is that this kind of thing is actually happening in architecture right now, right? Like, so we can see it um, in really amazing ways in academic unions um, sort of throughout the country. Um, but uh, there's also like actually like a number of workplaces organizing in architecture right now. And that's like something, you know, I can imagine 10 years ago, like wasn't like on the radar at all. Um, like I, I was, uh, I had like a really delightful um, uh, section for one of the classes I was teaing um, last quarter where uh, a few students were like, hey, um, we want to talk about like organizing and what it means to like graduate into uh, and like move into like architecture work. Um, and so like, I can't imagine that happening when I was in grad school um, for my MRC. So, you know, things are moving and uh, like stuff's happening in architecture. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I guess that's basically what I wanted to say. Maybe lastly, just that like, um, uh, like events like this and kind of moments where things are like in crisis and like the entire like labor movement and sort of um, uh, like many social movements kind of come together um, are like, really incredible expressions of like the sort of breadth of all of this stuff right so you know our power doesn't just come from internal organizing it also comes from like coordinating with other unions with other organizations um that you know we had like a lot of really important um exchanges with our dsa chapter for instance where like we mobilized in a huge way um for political organizing during the elections that like we definitely couldn't have done on our own and that like dsa would have been uh limited in capacity in doing on their own so like um you know uh same way that like at a workplace, we are stronger together. It's the same way, you know, um, at the scale of unions themselves. Um, okay, I I'll stop. I can keep rambling, but I don't want to. Thanks. Also great to see um, everyone here that I know. Um, it's, been, it's been a minute. Thank you, um, Shota. That was not rambly at all. Um, I'll just um, move on. Um, Al said that they could go next without me calling. Benedict also sent me a text telling me that the TA in me is on strike and I shouldn't call on people. I think he's very right. Um, so, um, Eyal would like to share a screen though, but I saw that she was made host. Okay, they, sorry, they were made host. sharing my screen, but didn't unmute myself. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for sharing, Shona, it's great to hear from you. Um, I'm also organizer in the architecture lobby, so I'll be touching on that a little bit too. Um, but first, I wanna thank you, Graduate Workers of Columbia, for this opportunity to kind of drop some knowledge at the digital picket line. Um, it's astonishing and frankly quite depressing to see the lengths that the Columbia administration will go to deny you, all of their workers, uh, the, pay, the fair pay benefits and recourse that are even more important now more than ever. Um, when I graduated in 2017 from Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, I had hoped that the bargaining process would start quickly and go smoothly. Um, oh, how naive and wrong I was. Um, as a former member of the Graduate Workers of Columbia, I stand in solidarity with all of you. Um, remember that it's all of your collective actions that are shifting the dial. Um, so I'm calling this talk revolution with like R in parentheses, so evolution and solidarity, um, because recently I've been reading um, Revolution and Evolution in the 20th Century by Grace Lee Boggs, who's an Asian American intersectional feminist who went to Barnard for college, actually. Um, Boggs makes the case that revolution is not or is an evolutionary process, not just a singular event. Um, she writes that most people think of revolution in terms of instant revolution, uh, rather than in terms of protracted struggle. And she describes rebellion as opposed to revolution as an event that disrupts society, but does not provide, provide what is necessary to establish a new or social order. So then what is revolution exactly? Um, I'm gonna read you some parts from uh, page 19 specifically. Um, a revolution is not just for the purpose of correcting past injustices. 
a revolution involves a projection of people into the future. It begins with projecting the notion of a more human human being, that is a human being who is more advanced in the specific qualities which only human beings have, creativity, consciousness, and self-consciousness, a sense of political and social responsibility. A revolution is a phase in the long evolutionary process of humankind. It initiates a new plateau, a new threshold on which human beings can continue to develop, but it is still situated on the continuous line between past and future. It is the result both of long preparation and a profoundly new, a profoundly original beginning. Without a long period for maturing, no profound change can take place but every profound change is at the same time a sharp break with the past. So I'm talking about revolution, kind of connecting it to the strike and what you all are doing um, with the union and asking for more, um, but what does this actually require and how can we achieve the political and moral development required to cope with where we are right now? And uh, Grace uh, Boggs also argues that um, it's not by the development of, uh, of, of economic forces or technology. It's, it's not by simply making what already exists more available uh, to more people on an equitable basis. And it's not uh, just a spontaneous rebellion. It's not like this, like one strike will do something. Um, it's, it's a much longer term thing than that. So revolution requires solidarity. And what exactly does that look like? Um, I'll give you some examples from uh, my own organizing. Um, these are some images from uh, uh, that have to do with the architecture lobby. Um, the architecture lobby was formed uh, quite a few years ago, but um, has recently been making more partnerships with groups that are organizing on the ground. So kind of practicing that, uh, that theory that like architects are workers and should be standing in solidarity with people on the ground. This uh, image on the top right is this hideous tower that's actually towering over another kind of tower over here, um, designed by shop architects. Um, and that this group, Artists Against Displacement, was rallying against. You can see that there are uh, like Asian people, this is in Chinatown, there are Asian people like doing Tai Chi in the rendering, but like, does that actually mean inclusivity or diversity at all? It means that there's this huge tower that's kind of like floating um, and gentrifying the neighborhood. Um, so the architecture lobby has recently, at least the New York chapter has recently um, sort of formed an alliance with um, artists against displacement um, to, to kind of work against this very real problem that's happening um, within, uh, our, our, within uh, New York City. Um, and so it's a lot of doing, doing the research about what other groups on the ground are doing um, and partnering up with them. And it's also this argument that Shoda was also making um, about how architects are workers um, and that our labor is very asymmetric as that book says. Um, and uh, we're an organization that's basically trying to unionize architects because um, it's, it's, we're kind of in the same kind of precarious um, situation. And that even happens when you're in grad school, when you're trying to work as a TA um, and do your studio work at the same time. Um, all of that kind of comes to play. Um, another example is also with the architecture lobby, but more specifically through something called solidarity space. And um, this was solidarity through cross-generational talking and sharing. These pamphlets, uh, which kind of explain in very legal terms what sexual harassment means, um, was, uh, were passed out in early 2018 when the conversation about gender discrimination and harassment in architecture changed um, when the Me Too movement focused the spotlight on Richard Meyer, um, who's an architect. And this was an important moment for workers, especially workers who had experienced sexual harassment in architecture, academia, and practice to find solidarity with each other and organize for change. So through a series of consciousness raising group style conversations called Solidarity Space, architects and designers across identities, generations, and career paths came together to ask, what opportunities does this change in the conversation give us despite having to relive traumas? And how does working together give us power in numbers? 
and how can workers support each other across professional lines? Um, last but not least, um, I feel like we've, we've all learned a lot about um, solidarity from Black Lives Matter and all of the protests and uh, the, the very sustained work that's been happening um, in, in, in protests in the United States and around the world. Um, and I put this image here, uh, it's, I found it on Instagram yesterday. It says someone's uh, holding a sign, an Asian person's holding a sign that says, I owe, owe my Asian pride to Black pride. So this is really about solidarity through similar experience and acknowledging that there is like a, a line of this evolution of changes that are happening and you should always acknowledge the history that comes before you. Um, so I like to think of solidarity as uh, uh, like a form of labor love, understanding that we as workers are in this long-term um, protracted struggle together that doesn't mean we don't celebrate wins or find ways to struggle that harm fewer people. It means that we situate ourselves in a long trajectory, um, a timeline, knowing that this revolution is in a long line of evolutions, um, knowing that this is not just simply a conflict between rich and poor or the haves and have nots, but between different concepts of what a human being is and how it is to live. Um, so I leave you with this last message that the revolution creates the future and solidarity between workers is what makes the space for new futures to emerge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eyal. Um, I'm just gonna um, move on to... I'm, I don't mind jumping in. Perfect, thank you, Shumi. <laughs> I don't mind jumping in because I'm not gonna say very happy things. So I'm kind of hoping that the rest of you do. Um, so I just wanna get it over with because I might cry. Um, all right, so I think I'm here. Laura uh, invited me to join um, because a couple of years ago, Laura and Kadamberi Bakshi and Peggy Dima were invited to the school where I teach to take part in a symposium about labor. Um, I just pulled up the presentation that I was asked to give um, at that symposium and it was quite upsetting because it just feels very, very hypocritical. So I guess, what I'm saying is that despite my institution hosting some of you um, with the sort of ages of talking about this shit, um, it's not been very good. And I'm speaking to you as in AL's terms, somewhere down the road. Um, and it's not very nice here. Um, so there was a two month industrial action at the beginning of last year, just before. I might need to take a break. That's no worries. No worries, thank you. I'm happy to be on screen being like this because it's part of it. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, do the folks of Dark Matter University wanna jump in? Sure. Uh, that being Lexi Jalisa and myself. Okay. Um, thank you, Shumi, and thank you, Al. Um, this is great. We're so happy to be here. Um, I'm Jerome Hayford, and um, Lexi and Jalisa are, are with me. Hi. Oh, EMU. Hello. And um, we wanted to really just introduce um, this this network to you guys and we did a little bit of reflecting as to how um i think what we're doing in dark matter relates to this larger struggle uh so i could share my screen lexi delisa do you want me to share my screen and we go through that works all right let's see here oh i need to have a permission yeah. and can <clears throat> we meet jerome co-host so he can share. Thank you. And um, I, I want to just hold space. Uh, Shumi, if you want to interrupt at any time, 
you let me know. <laughs> what you just said is going to be funny in a minute. I'll tell you why later. Okay. All righty here. So, hi, everybody. Um, we're here on behalf of a larger group who organized in the summer of 2020 um, around some of these ideas and urgencies that had been building uh, really across, um, across all, a lot of in different institutions and bodies, um, but particularly in the kind of built environment, pedagogical and professional space. And um, AL is part of our crew, as you can see by their background. Uh, and, you know, we, we decided to call this effort Dark Matter um, University, really playing off of some of those words uh, and ideas of a kind of outsidership or a, a sort of other force um, that could unite us and um, build new forms. So uh, as you see here on the screen, um, you know, we kind of introduced Dark Matter University as BIPOC-led, anti-racist design justice school. Um, collectively seeking radical transformation, the radical transformation of education and practice towards a just future. And we're, we stand here in solidarity with all of you um, uh, and this larger movement. And so uh, I wanted to introduce the kind of mission, the five, these five sort of principles um, uh, that, that are part of what is really a living Kind of document um, that we are always building, always changing, um, but we felt it as a kind of like guiding, guiding light um, or starting point uh, that we would sort of set out to in, in this effort um, to to kind of as a first as a first five efforts um, with an with an ambition to create new forms of knowledge and knowledge production. Uh, also new forms of institutions and power, new forms of collectivity and practice, new forms of community and culture, and very importantly, this being a kind of act of design itself. Uh, and so like centering design uh, and new forms of design as, as part of this, um, this new entity. And, uh, you know, and Jalisa and Lexi, feel free to jump in here. We kind of, when we were asked to speak today, um, we felt that Dark Matter U was important in that um, literally simply the, cre the kind of creation of community and our bodies, even in digital space together, producing knowledge and um, a kind of collectivity uh, is so critical. Uh, so we meet often and um, so much is produced literally in the relationality of, of meeting. Uh, but we felt, it, you know, kind of thinking about this, um, this strike and this movement that some of the things happening in DMU um, or that DMU is about that relate, I think, to this larger issue of labor um, has to do in, in kind of one, the building, again, the building of alternative forms of knowledge, power, practice, and institutionality that uh, is really an ongoing thing that happens in this kind of network practice of DMU. Uh, and then how um, that how that occur, you know, the activism becomes a kind of translating of activism as teaching and what it even means, what even a classroom might be or the audience or the sort of authority models might be in that process. Uh, and then, you know, possibly more, even more importantly for this discussion, you know, as a kind of like byproduct, but also overt sort of effort in Dark Matter U is the kind of, you know, little and not so little ways that we are trying to kind of subvert the precarity um, of the practice and, of, and in particular academia through this network, uh, which results in a kind of several kinds of kind of collective bargaining um, and also a kind of radical mentorship within these and, and leveraging of opportunity within that space um, that sort of subvert some of the kind of alienation and um, um, separation and parceling of these institutions. Um, 
Yeah. So there, oh, go I was, ahead, Julissa, yeah. <laughs> I was going to talk about designers. We, were, we wanted to mention designers' protests, which I'll put a link tree here. Um, designers, the, this collective is really it has such a pivotal role in how um, dark matter was formulated last year. Um, but we really are. They, so these are the nine demands from from designers' protests in terms of design justice in the built environment and design um, fields. But we uh, dark matter really responds to the to the ninth demand, which is to redesign design education and training. But I was going to just read off the um, the latest kind of script because that's also a living document of the the ninth demand, which says um, design justice demands we proactively challenge existing models with radical anti racist and decolonized models of design education training and licensing to reflect the history of spatial injustice and build new measures to ground our work in the service of collective liberation. Um, and that's the latest demand. And I think it's really kind of like a really huge, like kind of part of what, how we want to, I guess, imagine like the role of dark matter um, university in, um, in knowledge sharing and um, yeah, check out their link tree. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, and it's so wonderful how this whole effort came about in last summer was really this kind of organic and intentional confluence of um, a kind of latent community of actors and emerging sort of um, voices uh, in this sort of larger professional academic institutional space from the DAP collective, from these institutions from the, some of the various cities around the, the country. And we were just talking and started to form this thing out of these existing sort of latent kind of conversations and efforts. Um, which, which then kind of, this became a sort of like statement around the vision that we, we cannot th survive and thrive without immediate change towards an anti-racist model of design education and practice. Existing systems have not been able to transform away from centering and advancing whiteness through their reliance on an implied dominant and racialized subject and audience. The impacts of that centering are widespread and can be felt in the inequities that global extraction, racial capitalism and colonialism have created. The earth and the majority of its people have suffered tremendous harm as a result. Collective liberation, as Julissa was saying, can not only occur within the confines of individual institutions. Dark Matter University is founded to work inside and outside of existing systems to challenge, inform, and reshape our present world towards a better future. So again, different models of revolution, evolution are out there. The model that we sort of have begun to actively tweak and test is this idea of dark matter, both being inside and outside of these systems to subvert them and kind of challenge them. Uh, which, you know, takes shape in a number of ways and a number of constellations as both a kind of like organizational aesthetic and, and sort of logistical practice. So we, we gather and there's, an, it's, a, it's a, you know, sort of constellation model, I would say of, 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 of work um, where there's sort of orbits and micro orbits of folks working on these different efforts like broadcast campus and curriculum within the kind of um, both physical and digital space. <clears throat> uh, this, is, this is just a kind of run, running tally of where things have, have gone since last, last summer. Uh, I think there's many more people now on the roster um, from different states. Uh, and you know the main push was to really start to kind of achieve a degree of kind of agency and as a kind of university with our, our with courses, um, both of, and we'll get into this, being kind of generated literally within our network, but also kind of cross-pollinating institutions by leveraging and subverting the Zoom space. Um, and, and, then coming, and then coming up with modules of our own um, and bringing kind of also not, not only knowledge and people into the system, but also the capital of these schools and kind of um, uh, using that capital to kind of, uh, and distributing it, redistributing it in different ways um, through the different um, uh, folks teaching of these courses in our network. So this were, these were two co-taught 
um, courses uh, uh, between um, a, uh, H some HBCUs and um, some Ivy League institutions, which again, uh, as a kind of, you know, in a sort of small, but, uh, you know, I think there's some, some radical potential here, utilized the kind of pandemic uh, and the Zoom remote teaching to kind of subvert the space of the classroom and create a third space, a third institutional space uh, that brought students from these different, very different schools into the same space of the classroom uh, and also redistributed and utilized a sort of differential in resources of those schools towards a kind of subversive academic environment. Um, and, and so then, you know, with the idea that not only is when you change the, the, the actual space of instruction, the actual conditions of instruction, the bodies in, in within that space, um, different forms of knowledge, different forms of re relationality and power uh, might be kind of produced. So this was a, a snapshot from that Tuskegee um, course uh, led by Justin Moore um, and was kind of uh, brought, brought a few of us from DMU in to teach a kind of module in that course over Zoom. Uh, I don't know, Lexi, do you wanna talk about the different course types or do you want me to keep going? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think maybe we can, we can. Am I going too long? <laughs> no, 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 not if we, we skip towards the, the, um, the later slides where we look yeah, at. Yeah, maybe slide 15, yeah. 15 would be yeah. good. All right. So, so again, these are some of the courses. Um, yeah. And again, you, you, yeah, go over here. Yeah, maybe the, that one's good. Um, I, just to say that like part of what's so interesting about organizing is the people that you meet through organizing as well and through kind of the process of, of you know, really trying to define why you're there. And I think that um, I met Jalisa on a, um, a Zoom where we were like, oh, we'll design the website for DMU. And that kind of spun off into a way of designing with three people where we started to kind of um, all try to you know, touch a graphic design poster before it would go out. Um, the next one, and then uh, next slide. Also thinking about how like the campus could exist kind of in a digital space, thinking about like the um, metaphor between kind of the anti-master plan. So thinking about how, you know, um, different kinds of universities like and, and schools um, have something to teach us like at Columbia as well um, in terms of what their traditions are, what their histories are, et cetera. Um, next slide. And this is just to show kind of like a tiny microcosm of the universe of, of how we've been working together. So Jerome and Curry are teaching fugitive practice at Yale and Howard. Curry and Jalisa are teaching for with at Carleton. Jalisa and Lexi are teaching power tools. Lexi and Dan are teaching drawing and rep. Um, but that really trying to leverage the connections as opposed to which institutions we're part of and the conversations that we have between each other as teaching material itself. Yes, and the kind of essential, the essential, um, at, at the very least, partner, if not collective model, of these opportunities. So there's a kind of built-in um, relational um, gathering uh, and distributing of these appointments. Yeah, and these are just. This is just a snapshot of like what we've been up to. This is not everything, all, but just a few things that we've been up to that represent Lexi, Jerome, and myself, and, and AL, AL's teaching Foundations of Design Justice. Um, and I think really what's important here is that this is kind of representative of DMU and not these sort of hosting institutions. And I think it really is interesting to think that like as we're developing these courses and the kind of conversations we're having really are kind of about these this, uh, this rhizomatic network that we're a part of that is DMU and not really about it being this, um, you know, what is it's these, large institutions that have so much power. And it, it's, it is, has been very empowering to develop these courses and see the, the relationships between them and the kind of conversations that we're having um, between these, converse, uh, these, these courses and how, how we're working. So we were just gonna show a few snapshots of some of them. Um, yes, and, and, and you know, for example, with the foundations course, there was a kind of collective bargaining um, involved, you know, employed with um, those schools. And then the, between, I think, six different schools, all of that, um, all of the kind of pay was flattened and distributed evenly from those courses. So we, we kind of used our network, our, our, our status as a kind of 
collective to make some demands and also like flatten the disparity of what these schools pay or, or are able to pay in this case. Yeah, so one class that we're teaching now is called Power Tools. And a part of this came out of wanting to create a course catalog for DMU and looking at the last whole Earth catalog or the whole Earth catalog. And then also trying to look at the two movements of kind of the, the hippie modernism, but then also the um, Black Panthers co evolution quarterly insert. Um, just thinking about how we could co opt the whole Earth catalog for anti racist efforts. Um, so this whole class is really asking students to identify, implement, and document architectures of activism. So quite literally feeding from DMU into carving out an institutional space for us to teach students and work with them in order to um, implement new projects. Next slide. Um, this is an example of one student who started to identify power structures in terms of where the money really goes in terms of the Columbia as an institution identified moments of protest, but then also started to try to organize and um, intervene in the underground tunnel system at, at Columbia. Next slide. And another student who is like trying to use AR to challenge media bias. Next slide. Um, students who are creating printed material that um, can become posters that um, really ask for like live feedback from students. And that kind of includes digital and physical space between posters and Miro, holding uh, GSAT more accountable to on the futility of listening and other um, kind of, kinds of letters and efforts that were made over the summer. Um, next slide. And then another student who's physically trying to co-opt the newsstand that's at 116th and Broadway with all of our power tools inside of it. So uh, a way of creating a mini collective in a university setting with students who um, have strong opinions and trying to provide safe, safe spaces for them. And so here we're just gonna, I was just gonna show a few snapshots of some of the, some of the the work from a course that I taught, a studio that I taught with Curry Hackett um, at Carleton University. Um, this, so really what was important here in the first project is that we looked at, we had the students look at um, all these, what we were saying, what we were calling black cultural artifacts, we called them artifacts. And having, um, I think through studying and creating these kind of notational devices about these performative, uh, these performative practices um, I think something that kept coming up is people were like, well, what is, what is the point of doing this? And really it was about acknowledging, legitimizing and validating black culture and creative production as uh, a valuable source of, I guess, a valuable source of knowledge and of, of a methodology. Um, what was really interesting, so this is Beat Your Feet Kings in DC. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, here, a student, um, Anthony, was uh, studied DJ Screw and the screwed up click this freestyle and DJ Screw's home in Houston. Um, and then in the next slide, you'll see um, here, the student was looking at, um, obviously this is about the intersection of, of black and brown culture with um, queer communities in Harlem, but um, diagramming this, uh, this particular um, performance. So I think what was a really important question here is, is really, how, I think, thinking about what is valuable knowledge and what and how do we legitimize and and, and kind of think about that labor. Um, and I, it's still something we're working through, but I think what's interesting is just having the opportunity to, to have these conversations and create work around these conversations. But I'll also say the other interesting thing was that the students also found these really interesting ways of note of citing the, the people in, in these videos, which I thought was like a really interesting, it brought up a really interesting other kind of, um, it brought up something I didn't think about until we were teaching it is like, how do you cite, how do you, how do we create like even new citations to, um, to kind of um, respect the kind of labor that people have put into our culture? Um, so yeah, there, there's a little snapshot of our course, but I could go on about it, but um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I just have a, I think a couple slides here of, of the course um, that I'm currently teaching with Curry Hackett also um, between Howard University and Yale University uh, called Fugitive Practice, which is introducing and sort of recentering um, primarily black and indigenous modes of cultural and spatial praxis and production um, uh, that we sort of kind of decide to ref 
refer to as fugitive practices um, and kind of creating a space uh, again between those two institutions uh, and frankly and in particular for um, some of the students uh, mostly of color at Yale where they're in the in the kind of built environment space so few faculty um, kind of centering these modes uh, and again like I met Curry on an early call for Dark Matter U in June or in July and uh, you can see how these how these efforts have kind of made their way into these more formal um, projects. So this is just a slide of some of the guests that we've had in that course, which I just got out of before this call. Um, Rafi Rivero um, with his unarmed project and um, Jessica, Jessica Valores, who was just here this morning talking about um, black fugitive folklore and modes of kind of marunage and outsidership uh, as kind of um, legitimate modes of spatial and uh, kind of um, systemic praxis. So I think that's that's all we got, guys. <laughs> that's great. Lots of cool stuff going on. I hope that was enlightening. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much. There were I, I have many many thoughts and questions, but um, we'll we'll hold it and I'll just um, pass it over to Shumi. Thank hey, you. thank you. Thanks for being all oh, sweet, everyone. And uh, yeah, enlightening for sure, encouraging, just generally lightening uh, in the best possible way of, of my load listening to you guys, because, um, well, just to be here and to be in a situation where, what, 235 people who have been able to um, free themselves of whatever responsibilities they have and are getting together that's just incredibly hopeful and it was that that made me emotional plus the recollection of hopefulness that was present at that symposium a couple of years ago um, yeah so like I was starting to say I guess I'll just tell you what has happened I have zero filter so I ought to also tell you that I'm quite nervous but I also don't care my colleagues however are really nervous for me um, which should tell you something about the health of how it feels. Um, scared for me for participating in a strike and for Instagramming about it and so on. But obviously it's, um, it's my right, so that's okay. Plus I don't work for CSM today. Um, so yeah, I'll just tell you what happened and hopefully we can just talk. Um, this this uh, strike happened for about 60 days. We wrote a letter. Uh, something like 90% of the teaching faculty in my program were on strike. Um, the people who decided that they couldn't be on strike generally tended to be, well, not yeah, generally tended to be um, the people in management um, who felt that their responsibilities were worth keeping. Um, it was a really positive time for staff. We have very, very few faculty. And this again is maybe reflecting some of your situations. Very, very few, what would be the equivalent of tenured faculty? It doesn't work like that, but just permanent contracts for the time being. Um, and the vast majority of faculty on all architecture programs everywhere are on insanely precarious and insanely underpaid compared to anywhere in the States, regardless of your condition or state. Um, just, you know, I, all of you who know me have asked me in the past, why does anyone continue to do academia? But that's, let's say, a larger problem that like an architecture program can't necessarily be responsible for fixing. So the letter that we sent was quite specific to problems of asymmetry that we found in pay conditions, gender conditions, labor conditions, race, obviously, and just wage insecurity in general. Um, unfortunately, the end of the strike coincided exactly with lockdown and we haven't been out of lockdown since. So the isolation and the alienation which is perpetrated by the large systems of academies, let's say, was obviously sort of perpetrated by natural, well, by, by the pandemic. And that, that has been very hard to bear. Um, since the pandemic, obviously, all sorts of other priorities have completely eclipsed any concern that may have been even performatively demonstrated 
with regards to labour conditions. Um, and again, faculty, as in fixed faculty, are really concerned. I think I am concerned for the health and safety of all of the precarious teaching staff and non-teaching staff who help the school. And we're just, I think, I don't think I'm being too incriminating by saying that I've been extremely disappointed. Maybe I'm just, I think maybe all of us are naive and disappointed um, that these systems don't work better. And so it is um, kind of inspiring, but also in a sort of dread way that DMU has found a space outside of the institution because increasingly it does seem to me like it's just, that's where it has to be because this thing just isn't, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really having a hard time thinking, can I be part of this? I, I like being an educator, I love being an educator, but I just don't know. So the current situation after the largest industrial action of universities in a long time last year. The current situation is that I see colleagues being targeted for speaking out and bearing the brunt of scrutiny to the detriment of their physical and mental health. And I see my colleagues having to strategize painfully to work within the bureaucratic systems of unions as well as universities. You know, I'm always being told by my colleagues, just like, you can't just like weep on screen, just like you have to hold it together. Let's go to the union, we'll talk to someone. There's, there's a process. You've got, you've got, you know, you've got grounds, uh, or, you know, these are the kinds of things we tell each other. And like, no, you know, that guy's really good and he'll come to you with meetings and he'll say, it's okay, you won't have to be on your own and all of this. But that process is also just so debilitating and it's, just so frustrating that it has to be so hard to tell the truth and not be terrified that you might lose your tiny shitty unpaid job um, much less have the capacity to think about what education could be or how you can provide uplift if even surviving is really difficult um, so that is kind of where it is I don't mean to paint out paint the institutions as willfully damaging, although it's difficult to understand how you could say otherwise. It's just that the institution doesn't know any other way of, uh, of operating other than to be metric in terms of what value systems it imposes. And um, it, it's just fatal, you know, it is. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really, really heartened that you're all here and I'm so glad that it's possible. I mean, I, I'm believing that it's possible to speak freely here because it isn't possible for me to speak freely like this at my institution, it's not mad. So yeah, I, I guess that's all I have to say and then let's talk about the rest. <laughs> Thank you, Shumi. Thank you so much for sharing and, and speaking up. Um, it's incredibly courageous of you. Um, I'm just leave that out there for a moment and um, maybe um, Esther wants to chime in. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, for, thanks for organizing this and uh, inviting us. And uh, Shumi and I have had many conversations <laughs> about uh, academia. And I, I'll talk about office hours, which is an initiative that in some ways sort of stem from my frustrations with academia. And, but I, I feel like I should probably also say uh, like all cards on the table that, um, you know, I, I went to graduate school for art before entering into architectural history in my thirties. So I um, had a tenure track and was tenured while doing my PhD. And that experience was so formative in seeing how institutions are structured, how decision-making is made, how power is allocated, um, and, and also seeing the, the, the difference in treatment between adjunct faculty and tenured faculty. So I, I say that with, you know, um, 
and, and at the moment, I don't have an academic affiliation for many reasons, which I won't get into right now, but, um, but we can speak very candidly, I think. I look forward to speaking candidly about that during the conversation because that was, that was incredible for me to witness and participate in basically, like uh, pretty early in my career, I would say. Um, anyways, so, uh, but I've been here, invited here to talk about office hours. So um, office hours is a global mentoring initiative that began quite recently in July of last year to support students and emerging design creatives that identifies black, indigenous and people of color or BAME if you're in the UK. Um, we program free conversations between like intergenerational conversations um, between um, students, mid-career and established practitioners. And really this, uh, this entire initiative has two big goals. The first is to increase the visibility and self-representation of BIPOC folks um, in both academia and also in the professions, uh, the design professions at large. Um, we believe that actually rendering visible folks that are practitioners uh, that identifies BIPOC is crucial for younger generations to self-identify and to form the belief that being a creative is possible uh, for many of us that have not come from money and do not come from generational wealth and maybe the first people like I certainly was the first in my family to get any um, any education uh, this is you know it's really really important to be able to see someone that is doing something that you're doing and there's tons of research to, to prove this or whatever but we know from lived experience enough folks that have participated in office hours um, can testify to this that this is also the reason why all the speakers have agreed to do it um, when especially in its early kind of formation when we didn't have any funding or any kind of real real structural support um, and secondly the big mandate of office hours is to provide free information and access um, that address the barriers to entry and success for BIPOC creatives in an intimate format. Um, it, there, it's intentional that these are group sessions as opposed to one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions um, because we are trying to encourage folks to, while embracing intersectionality, uh, encourage our speakers to engage in really open discussions about how their overlapping identities have, you know, informed their insights and their particular experiences as well as the particular privileges and challenges. Um, but also what, what one of the biggest things I think, and to go back to AL's um, point around um, solidarity, is that, you know, singularity and competition are crucial ingredients to white supremacy. This is how you end up with the kind of token hire, the diversity hire. I know this as being that person. I was one of, I think, three female identifying, you know, people of color uh, in a faculty of over 100 at OCAD University, you know, several years ago, but a decade ago. Um, and, you know, a lot of folks will play that card and they need to, they, they feel they need to play that card in order to have entry into systems of education and teaching, et cetera. But you know, at the end of the day, it, it hurts all of us. And so, um, so this is why actually uh, one of the requirements and community agreements for office hours is that everybody that participates turns their cameras on and is accountable and not anonymous. They're an accountable member of a community that will engage in a group discussion. Um, so this is to say in terms of how it works, it's really important for us that it's a free and accessible um, service in a way or program. Um, you know, we're, we're having a discussion with Columbia University, but a lot of folks can't afford to go to Columbia University. And what's really, um, what, the reason why it was really important for me personally to have these be free is that, you know, I, it, it's really in some ways, I think a, a total fluke that I ended up going to all these Ivy League schools and getting this kind of education, given my background that I'm Canadian and, you know, we don't have an IV system in Canada, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm really encouraged that we we do have those folks that are, you know, in that kind of circuit and system of education and that really kind of privileged space, but we also have a lot of folks that are not um, joining and they join us from all over the world. Um, so basically we just advertise on Instagram and we have 75 minute sessions that are, you know, now advertised twice a month. Um, and the first, well, it was for a while, 100, uh, 100 BIPOC students and emerging practitioners that sign up receive a, a, a Zoom link to the event and that's all it is. Um, we're now going to open it up to try to accommodate more people, but basically in these sessions, invited speakers tell the group about their professional journey and then offer, offer hopefully really practical advice. Um, but, and I think, you know, what's, I think the most part, important part about mentorship is actually being able to visualize a kind of path, um, which may or may not be right for you, but understanding that, you know, there are a lot of ways to navigate these fields and also encouragement that you can actually pursue something that is creative when Oftentimes, if you come from a, a lower income background, you know, you're, you feel really pressured to take something really kind of quote unquote practical, 
right? Um, you know, that, that can earn money because you have no generational wealth to fall back on. Um, so that's sort of, that's it. And, you know, our topics range from everything like how to start an architecture office to becoming a licensed architect to, um, you know, yesterday we had a session on transforming design education towards more equitable reforms. And um, the DIY aspect is super important, partially because I think we have the, the majority of our demographic uh, falls between the ages of anywhere from 17 to mid thirties. Um, and, you know, I think this is really about understanding not only the potential of building something new, but the pitfalls of how these institutions and structures and practices have been built based on models of competition and singularity, and hopefully trying to feature practitioners um, that can communicate their own strategies for actually dismantling those kinds of logics. And, and you, know, you know, none of this is perfect, like we're all trying to figure it out, but, and, and this is really kind of an experiment around alternative forms of sociability. It was really inspired in a lot of ways from a number of things, not only my own experience um, and just the practical nature of having a lot of young folks over the years contact me because, you know, I'm like one of the few people of color that are operating in a certain realm or whatever. Um, but they, uh, you know, I, I think that this idea around thinking about alternative forms of sociability, what does it mean to have a space whereby difference can operate without hierarchy, that, um, that a group conversation can actually take place in which we can start to map out a lot of commonalities. Um, and I think this as a multiracial, you know, kind of interethnic, you know, um, solidarity building space, like it's been for me so rewarding to do, even though it's been also been really challenging to do this on top of everything else. Um, it, I guess it's sort of a grassroots thing for a while, but now we're actually starting to gain more support. And um, I think the hope is that we can essentially start to build out actual legacy programs and actually operate as an organization that really tries to promote a cultural shift towards civic responsibility in the design fields, because certainly the design fields do not have that sensibility about them. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say is that, you know, each week or every two weeks, I should say, we have BIPOC folks joining with us from over 12 countries. And what that's, it's been so overwhelming that we have folks literally up at three, four in the morning joining these talks. Um, and I have so much faith that, you know, if someone in their mid twenties is like that passionate about architecture and transforming the design fields that we're, we're probably, we're probably, you know, there's a lot of like optimism out there. Um, but anyways, I'll just end this by saying yesterday we had a conversation with Dr. Dory Tunstall about, um, about what it means for folks that are, you know, even adjuncts or tenure track or tenure faculty that are BIPOC to enter into upper administration in, uh, in universities to think about and to also render transparent what kind of power you're, you're, um, you know, you're afforded and also what kind of power that you can try to um, you know, sort of uh, reallocate and redistribute. And I think, you know, I don't want to speak for the folks that attended the session, but for me, at least it was, uh, I, I have to say, you know, Dory is now leading an institution that I was part of and I left before Dory, you know, took on that role. And that's it in a relatively short period of time. There's been a huge amount of change. Um, and even this morning, I was speaking with someone in the UK about how, you know, um, what was really informative is that is that Dory is incredibly generous um, and not proprietary about the strategies that she's implementing. And there, there are very specific strategies um, that also are trying to reallocate and redistribute power and agency and a kind of like an accountability at every level of the institution, whether you're a student or you're a president, you know, and but that actively that kind of feedback loop of accountability is built in at every level to hold our own egos in place, like, you know, keep us in check at all times, but also to not buy into that model of singularity. So that, for example, instead of hiring one black faculty member, there's clusters of hires, right? And you start to build a kind of like community base um, and also really privileging indigenous perspectives first and foremost. So it's totally intersectional, sort of from like in, in every level structurally. That to me is, is, is super um, energizing because, you know, I think most folks on this grid, I mean, maybe you disagree with me, but I feel like a lot of the kind of, um, there's been a lot of virtue signaling from universities, et cetera, et cetera, where the changes have been topical and optical, but not structural. And one of the things that I think we also, you know, it's important to remember is that we talk about 
institutions and universities and systems as if they're objects outside of us or like entities outside of us, but actually they're people. These are the people that make decisions that are in positions of power, gatekeepers in power. And, and I think it's important to remember and identify those people that hold specific forms of power that are responsible for hiring, et cetera, um, that perpetuate certain kinds of exclusion and violence in, in a lot of ways. So that is all I will say for now. And um, yeah, happy to partake in conversation. Thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you all of you um, for um, these great um, inst non-institutions, institutions within institutions, institutions, non-institutions outside of the academy um, that you're building and creating under the roof of solidarity. Um, I think this has, at least for me, opened up so many thoughts and questions, but I just want to kind of open space for everybody also in the audience amongst you speakers and in the audience to um, ask questions, respond to each other. Um, you can take either stack in the chat or um, you can raise your hand. Um, and my colleagues will also help me moderate. Awkward Zoom silence always happens. I mean, I, I want to know specifically what your goals are <laughs> and what, because we keep having to sort of, or I keep on a personal level, I won't speak for my colleagues or my institution. I keep having to resize mine, you know, from like the safety of being able to say something to, oh, maybe one day we might be able to restructure how learning works. <laughs> in the classroom you know and just what what are yours and do you have how do you have yeah do you have and how do you have faith that they might be responded to is it just pay are there other things And you want to pick that one up? <clears throat> I think it's a fantastic um, question, but um, it's not necessarily one that can be easily no, answered. No, um, it's definitely not easily answered. It's I agree with that. That I feel like even just within our very little space of organizing um, in the union and. Um, leading up to the strike and over the many, many years of how long this has taken to, to even get, um, first to get Colombia at the table and then to start this conversation and et cetera. Um, the question of goals has always um, been a big one. And, um, and there have been also obviously disagreements within our unit of um, either kind of aiming for the really big, fantastic contract that helps a lot of people in precarious situations? Or should we start smaller to have some, some really tangible wins maybe earlier and then start going bigger from there? And these kinds of strategic questions, I think, um, have even been part of, of our little struggle. Right, like, is, is having a conversation a goal? Or where does it fit within the, the sort of, again, not necessarily an answerable question, but kind of things I'm thinking about myself. Is being able to have a conversation my goal in my institution? Is that even something I'm aiming for anymore? I got told the other day that I'm not being very generous with my institution. And I've had to reflect on that, on the idea that one's capital is used by an institution and one has the choice whether to give it or not. Um, but also whether one has the opportunity to, to do that or not. Sorry, it's all getting a bit philosophical. No, no, no. Um, Shoda, do you wanna? 
Um, yeah, I guess I, I totally don't have um, an answer answer, but I, I want to just connect like this conversation around goals to um, some of the sort of last comments um, that like Esther and the, um, and the conversation we were having a second ago that, um, you know, it's like, this is about like structural change, right? And so I think, you know, um, on our end, like what that means is that like the structures aren't just for the bad guys, right? Like we're talking about building our own structures here. And like, that's sort of um, what's really kind of beautiful about like the kind of formations that like, um, you know, office hours and like DMU and like these kind of projects are like proposing. And so I think, um, you know, the, the real like, maybe like one register that we could have, um, like that we could answer this question at is kind of like where that structure like turns into like, like our goals and our demands, right? So like, you know, I think forming structures in itself is like a perfectly legitimate and like extremely important goal, right? So that means uh, like, that's really all that a union is, right? It's like a legally protected structure for like keeping these things alive. Um, I think, you know, there are ways of, for instance, like taking some of um, the lessons that like, um, you know, we've, uh, we've learned from uh, from like many of these projects and basically like, okay, so maybe one thing that we can do is like incorporate them into a collective bargaining agreement. And that's like something that like has teeth and that like we can um, sort of use in like a much bigger framework kind of around like organizing and like um, like uh, bargaining for the common good, for example. So I think like we, you know, we can keep like um, the goal in mind as we like actually build power. Um, so I, you know, I really wanna like keep power itself as like one of our goals. Thank you. Yeah. And like, you know, just speaking on behalf of like some of us, that, you know, and all of us, frankly, probably here at, who are educators, but like with DMU, like mentorship is so important and like um, building a literacy around power and a kind of a sense of agency there. Like the more of us that there are like talking to each other I can't tell you how big of a difference that has made. Um, so like use technology, use the fact that we're, you know, on these platforms and like share information and be visible to one another in, in, in uh, it doesn't matter if it's over Zoom, what we're doing right now, it would be, would have been impossible 10 years ago. So like more membership, more mentorship and more of us kind of in these spaces is huge. Esther? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to echo both of those comments from Shetta and, and Jerome, but also, um, you know, I, I don't know how far your internal conversations have gone around organizing and unionizing for, for graduate students and adjuncts um, in particular, but I do think that, especially coming from an institution in Canada uh, before I came to the US, uh, that had a union, and then seeing how specifically architecture schools operate because I came from an art and design school, but uh, architecture schools in particular are like the wild west in terms of how people are hired, how people are fired, how contracts are negotiated. It's like, are you sitting next to the Dean at a dinner party? Are you right? Like what is the, your, what social capital do you have? I mean, it's, there's no metrics in place with transparency and having sat on hiring committees because on my committee work was like through the roof as a tenure track for three departments, we had like actual, like, um, like qualify, we had like a chart, you know, and everyone got a vote and it was like incredibly regimented for tenure track. But for adjuncts, it was just like, the chair happened to know somebody, they, there was a former student, blah, blah, blah. And, and as much as uh, this is about um, supporting folks that are in that system already, um, that are operating as adjuncts, which, which is incredibly precarious labor and very little pay. And, you know, you're, you're really just this kind of like crew of people that the university can call on when they want, or really when I say university, it's, you know, deans and chairs, et cetera, right? Like, let's just be real. Let's just name the people that make these choices. Um, I, in my opinion, a real union would have to also clarify how people are hired and also have a certain kind of transparency about the metrics by which people are assessed and invited in to participate in a system at every level of that system in order for it to be accountable. So it's not just about, you know, arguing for better pay, but it's also saying, how do you become a TA? What's the process of applying? This is actually a conversation I had with Jermaine Barnes, actually, like 
quite recently, well, maybe a few months ago, about how mentorship for him is about showing folks how to become a TA because that's not even transparent. And if you don't come from a family of academics or you haven't been privy to that world, you'll never know how to enter that system, right? And, and it really is a kind of system of nepotism in a lot of ways, which we need to eradicate because this is how bias is instituted and implemented. You know, bias is equally responsible for keeping people out, but also bringing people in. And we need to account for that in some way. So I just want to put that on the table because um, having been part of a union and, and, you know, lo and behold, I had no idea even how important that was when I got my first teaching gig, you know, right out of graduate school, um, like what, 13 years ago or something. Um, and now seeing how schools operate when, that do not have unions, it is for me, like, I don't know. I think we have an ethical responsibility to really rethink it on all levels from the ground up so that folks that may not have those kinds of connections, but may have incredible value to bring um, as educators can enter into that system, right? In ways that with accountability and that folks in gatekeeping positions are held accountable. There's something that they can be held accountable to. So I just want to put it on the table. <laughs> Um, thank you. I have um, Benedict on stack and there have also been um, really um, fantastic comments in the chat, um, but let's first go to Benedict. Thank you. Hi guys. Um, I just wanted to say, and this is somewhat in response to Jimmy's point about, you know, the relationship of discussions that people are having to, uh, you know, longer strategic goals or creation of structures um, like uh, you know, unions or, um, I, I just want to say I have a, so much appreciation for the work that um, is doing um, with this, the, the Holding Space Project, what Office Hours are doing, um, what uh, Dark Matter University is doing, because I think it is so important alongside organizations like the GW, GWC, more, um, you know, institutional frameworks like that to have these discussions also in non-institutional contact uh, context you know, to have a space for conversations about the the circumstances that are affecting people in their lives that may be related in some sense to an institutional structure like the university but to also create space for that outside of, of, of the, that formal setting um, because I think you know related to what Shoto is saying about the union as as you know a, an entity as a form that protect certain kinds of political action. Yes, it is that, but it's also a heavily regulated uh, form. It's, it's a form that's legally bound by agreements that have been made between organized labor and you know, the National Labor um, Board for you know, over decades. And so in that sense, I think it's something to be really aware of that, you know, that also those structures that you enter into Come with so many constraints about the possibility of political action with that too you know what you can strike over what you can't strike over and when um, and so in that sense i think it's so important to kind of keep these conversations alive in, in these non-institutional settings i'm just gonna briefly um read out loud a comment that laura made because i um, know that she's probably um in parental mode and cannot speak of sleeping baby. Um, so Laura writes, Shota appreciated what you mentioned about DSA earlier. We need to organize in relation to the state and in relation to institutions to shift these conditions. But this also takes tremendous energy and is exhausting, especially if organizing is not recognized by institutions as valid or valued or a valued form of labor, or is something that makes one a potential target for retaliation, which Jumi so beautifully spoke to. And then um, Anu also added a comment in the chat that I think is um, needs to be read out loud. Um, Anu, you can you can speak yourself if you want to. Or I'll just read it. Okay, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sandwiched in between other meetings, and I'm sorry I couldn't be here for the whole thing. But mostly, I was just uh, trying to echo what Esther said that. Um, I, I've spent many, many years as an adjunct uh, before getting this job, and I've also been in committee meetings as an adjunct because you're also asked to serve, do service as adjuncts. And I've, I have been in some very shocking meetings where a great 
amount of time was spent discussing adjunct hires. And I, as I've written in the chat, uh, you know, this is only one of the many kinds of things I think I've witnessed. I've witnessed some seriously racist things, but this piece I think is really important that um, I believe that um, the reproductive futures of graduate workers are actively worked against in the university system. And I think this is something that just is unconscionable. That's all I'll say. Thank you. Um, I see a comment in the chat by David. Do you want to say it out loud? Should I read it? Okay, I can quickly, yeah. Um, the key part of it was what Esther was saying about um, nepotism and the, the sort of gatekeeping that happens. Uh, it's very visible amongst the, the administration, at least the school I attended. Um, and students don't seem to be aware of the power or necessity of organizing. So I'm wondering if that's something, you know, what we're aiming at is also emerging, you know, people who are yet to encounter this at the professional level, but are sort of made used to the precarity and the subjectivity that you know, they're shaped to, to go along with this system. So I'm wondering how we can get at students before they've entered this. Yeah, David, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And I respond, I sort of piggybacked off of your comment in the chat, um, but I, I totally agree with you that like sometimes, I mean, a lot of times, especially students who are in architecture school may not realize the agency that they have as students because they're overworked. <laughs> um, they're working as TAs while going to studio. Um, they're being told like what they can and can't do. And it's like, and the school like system, the structure is so huge that it's like so difficult to navigate. Um, I do think that there is value in um, building solidarity between like students at the architecture school and across the university. Um, when I was uh, involved in the union, that was kind of like what drew me to it because I was like, there's, there's, there are issues that affect Columbia as a whole and, and like some of it may be amplified within the architecture school, but it's something that's shared among all the students and knowing that and being able to um, organize with other students and other workers um, who share that, who share that with you is super powerful. Um, and knowing that they have your back and that their solidarity is also super powerful. So kind of an answer, kind of not, kind of just piggybacking. Yeah, not only power as students, but also, you know, in graduate school, but also, you know, all of this and access to all of these structures starts really early. So don't forget that there are people who are younger than you even if it isn't through, um, you know, I mean, office hours is a great example, but just within your own personal life and in your community around you, um, there's always a possibility of kind of mentorship beyond teaching as well. I mean, you know. I don't know if I'm just jumping the queue in the stack. I apologize if I am, am I? No, Go ahead. I, I just really wanted to echo the previous comments and especially to the point around like, um, you know, I really feel Shumi like the, the difficulty of voicing and when you don't have, um, you know, you're not tenured, you don't have that kind of sec job security. And, and I know what it's like to actually be not invited back because I actually reported very inappropriate conduct from a from a male colleague and I was not invited back and that person is still teaching at that institution so I will say that um so I understand how that feels very uh very acutely um but I think I I kind of wonder if we're just going to use this to workshop strategies I sort of wonder from the vantage of let's just say adjuncts um and I think TAs sort of operate with a different set of issues if I'm honest maybe I'm wrong but I I say this as having been an adjunct and a TA <laughs> for many years um, 
but I, I, I sort of wonder how much about the adjunct position is about actually going to specific individuals that own those that are that system, right? The people that hire the adjuncts and saying, listen, we, we need to put accountability measures in place. Would you like, are you, are you in alignment with like discussing what that might look like? You know, like, would you be open to that? Um, to hold everyone accountable in this, you know, and it might be, and, and I would say also with institutions, get everything in writing. Don't, don't agree to just that one like conversation on the phone or whatever. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't hold people's memories or just like incredibly, they're, like they're like sieves very conveniently. Um, but, but I, I, you know, I wonder about targeting specific people, chairs of departments, deans, et cetera, and having those very specific conversations about what would accountability look like if, if we all agree that we do want this place to be an egalitarian, you know, institution, et cetera, et cetera, committed to very task, blah, 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 right? If we're gonna, if we're gonna hold you to task, like what would that look like? What was really illuminating to me yesterday was the kind of self-reflexivity of, you know, how, how one dean in particular who's committed to decolonizing design education also has has implemented those measures in place knowing that you know she needs to hold herself accountable right and i think that was a kind of model of leadership that i found so refreshing but also um really important to figure out how to model and replicate in other places and also kind of innovate as well right because we're all kind of figuring out like so i, I and again that might seem really naive but i find sometimes actually it's really simple <laughs> Just, you know, like seeing if people are amenable to even just a conversation around a table about, about what that might look like and having it be a discussion. Um, I don't know, maybe that's just incredibly naive of me, but I have found that actually sometimes those those kinds of um, discussions that are not uh, agonistic or antagonistic, but actually about um, a, a recognition of a collective problem and everyone's responsibility in, in that, in their participation in that problem and also in the solution. So. I'll just put that out there. Thank you for that. Um, Christine put a comment in the chat. Do you want to speak to it? Uh, sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kristen. Um, I'm a member of Designers Protest uh, and editor at Field Architecture. Um, but what I wanted to say uh, in my experience in grad school is that it's just just asking people like how, individual administrators that are in charge of these separate things like it's really hard to know how anything works like how any decisions are even made you know it's like I'm constantly asking constantly asking and nobody knows and nobody can say anything and it's like well, I'm just wasting my time. And then they're like oh let's make a committee and the dean is like oh the dean is supporting this committee and and then great, you go on the committee and and then it's like, well, I'm busy, I have to finish my thesis and like, and then I graduate and then it's like, okay, great. They made like a little statement on the website, like this community, you know, statement on the website and that's it, right? There's nothing structured, like, you know, again, uh, Esther was talking about like the sort of optical <laughs> change rather than like a structural change. And so I think, I mean, I guess the one thing that I would, uh, this is what I really appreciate about like office hours and also DMU is that it's sort of outside of the institution. It can kind of hold this, um, uh, what is it called? Sort of generational knowledge, right? Or, or like um, institutional knowledge. That's what I meant to say. Institutional knowledge for students and faculty. So you don't have to always start over, right? It's like one of the things I was like, oh, uh, trying to change this uh, syllabus or this course, right? It's like, <laughs> well, <laughs> Um, it turns out that course has been fought against every single semester, with the same complaints, but nothing changed, right? So it's like, anyways, that's, that's all I really wanted to kind of bring up is that there's this, there's such this trouble. And so like, I feel like there, if there are any actions, it has to involve folks from outside to institution, as well as, as well as in it. Um, but I'll stop there. No, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, Shumi? No? Shota's ahead of me. Oh, sorry. Sorry, didn't see Shota. Sorry. Oh, yeah, no, no problem. I, I just got a quick um, comment. Um, I, yeah, I think like this question of um, like accountability, not as like an abstract idea, but just like as a practice and sort of solidarity and like trust and like building these kind of spaces um, on just like a really kind of 
like interpersonal practical level um is like that that's um like these are things that like we don't really like you know we, we don't learn how to do that in school right like we don't uh, we don't learn how to do that um, in our primary education, certainly not like in the context of an architecture studio. Um, so like um, thinking back to some of the comments that um, Benedict and Esther were making, right, about like how you inhabit the institution, like, you know, like negotiating, um, knowing like how things run, for example, right? Like th these are things that, um, you know, we, we shouldn't like need to like spin our wheels and kind of like um, reinvent everything from the get go. Um, uh, uh, Eva, we were um, earlier talking about like how COVID has made us kind of like rethink organizing and like figure out um, like just how to communicate with people and how to like sort of practice democracy. Um, I think that's really like a key issue that we need to rely on each other for, right? That like we should sort of feel confident in asking folks like, I, you know, how, how do you do this? Like, well, it's like a good way to make this thing that we want to do happen. Um, just and just really quickly to go back to um, the, the comment Laura made in the chat, like, I think, um, like, DSA has been an incredible space for that, um, you know, like, I, I, I'm happy to give my DSA pitch anytime, but like, really, I think just have a space where people like practice democracy and like, you like, learn how to like, um, sort of negotiate common spaces and like how to vote and how to kind of, um, like, resolve conflicts. Um, I think like, these are, um, like, these aren't skills that are like, so easy to come by. I think I'm like, kind of constantly amazed when I see, um, you know, some of my comrades that have like dedicated like literally their entire lives to this. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, I, I just like um, sort of am almost paying attention from the sidelines sometimes. Um, I think like these are people that like we can learn so much from. Um, so like just um, once again, um, just urging us to kind of like reach out to like non-architectural spaces and like non-architectural um, questions of solidarity. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I just want to because I have to I have to jump out and it's so great to be here and I wanted to, to say thank you again for having me. But to that point, you know, I think both of these things are very true that a, so much has, has come before us and our ancestors have paved the way for these methods of organizing and we live in sort of new and unimaginable times and I cannot stress enough like the impetus to design new systems that are on you know both precedented and yet unprecedented out of what we find in front of us out of the the kind of material that is at our feet uh you know the the black faculty at at, at the architecture school wrote a letter of unlearning whiteness right uh collectively you know on a on a google sheet right these things didn't you know these things letters existed before but like the conditions that we find ourselves within today have never existed in this way. And I think that, you know, create, stay ahead of, you know, the, these forces that are oppressing us by creating new structures and new things in the world that did not exist before uh, is what I think is, is what we're being asked to do and what, we're, what we do as designers every day. And so often, frankly, it, it, you know, I look out and, it, and it's just amazing how time and time again, it's people of color who like are the ones being the moral checks on institutions on these things who are leading the way. And, you know, I just want to put that out there because it, it just time and time again is true. Just a short thing. I think that it's kind of interesting that I got into DMU because I helped organize a letter for my school and got so frustrated with writing the letter and had their response that I thought that kind of DMU was the answer. But through DMU, you know, found connections to also like work on it a lot and be like, I'm, I'm doing all of this work outside of the school. How do I also figure out how to get paid for it? So bringing it back to the school and back into the institution. So in a really weird, you know, nefarious kind of way, just figuring out how, you know, the, the, you can find an audience or receptive because the people are out there that agree with you, that believe in you across institutions and, and in other places. So, um, you know, it's, it's a fight, but I think that you can fight it in different ways that are, that resonate with you. Show me. Thank you. Um, I'll try and be quick. I think one thing that I am heartened by from you is is this no the communion that you're making whether that's through an organized union or whether that's through a sort of 
secret Zoom chat or I don't really care. But um, what's heartbreaking is that that's precisely what is abstracted. And, um, you know, we can we can talk about why another time. But um, I think that's that's the thing that I'm noticing when I'm seeing colleagues who have been having a harder time for having spoken up. It's they're isolated and the culture that is created is not one of trusting each other or, or kind of trusting that there's any real way to change anything. So please, if you are feeling like that or have, just don't buy into it because um, evidently it's really hard not to because even some of my colleagues, like I'm, I'm very much anonymous in terms of being so about everything. I think it may be because I'm not English, I don't know. Um, I think the other thing that I wanted to say is the damage of not having that communion and, and why I'm so worried about particularly um, very emerging kind of adjuncts and, and young lecturers and so on, is that as, as someone else said, we don't get taught this shit. We don't get taught how to take care of people or students. Oftentimes we reenact the systems of violence that we've kind of been conditioned with. We all know this, right? But I'm watching younger tutors get in shit because, you know, my students are very sensitized and having a hard time as yours are at the moment. And these young kids are hired for optics um, because they've done well in institutions that are respectable. And so they're just thrown in and they don't know how to manage these situations and they're not taught. And when the complaint comes, they'll get fired. And I, I and I'm asking my college to like make a space so that we can help that not happen. But it either or whatever, it isn't there. I'm not saying the will isn't there, but it, it hasn't happened. And as a result, there are my students who are endangered by that and my colleagues, younger colleagues, people whom we're trying to hire to rebalance things who are at risk of having really traumatic teaching experiences because we don't teach each other how to do stuff. The people who are in management have not done management 101. They're not there to kind of manage the skill set of their faculty and help people thrive. They're there to hold on to their jobs. And I just think whatever institution doesn't recognize that you need to create places to nurture each other, I'm just not sure how to deal with that institution. And again, this is where I find myself. So this space that you've made, please just hold it and multiply it, whatever. If that can be in the institution, then you're lucky. Stay, maybe consider staying with that institution if it gives you that space. Thank you. Um, I have Esther on stack and then I'm just going to say a question by Dare in the chat and then Camille in the chat. Let me know if I overlooked somebody. Esther? Okay, I'll try to be quick. I just wanted to respond to two points, but also piggybacking off of um, Shumi's point around will. Do, does, do the people that run institutions have the will to actually change institutions? Well, given that a lot of these discussions, I mean, of, of course, people have been organizing for a long time around labor rights. Um, uh, but student letters really kind of, I think, catapulted a lot of this. Um, prior to that, the same people were totally fine, because the status quo totally supported them, I imagine, because they they didn't, you know, there, there wasn't any, like, push to change things. So to return to actually Kristen's uh, comment about um, the lack of opacity, or the lack of transparency around how governance is actually um, implemented and, and power is actually distributed. I think that opacity is actually intentional. And if people tell you that they don't know, people in that system who are faculty and administrators tell you they don't know, they're lying to you because I know <laughs> and I'm not even at that school. And I will say this, that after those student letters were written, I had a lot of folks who wrote those letters reach out to me. I don't know why, <laughs> but they wanted to reach out to me to talk about their frustrations, which is fine. I mean, I'm happy to talk to people, but but I wasn't, I had no affiliation with those particular schools and they were ready to, uh, to, to talk about their frustrations with exactly what you had described, right? That, and that all this labor gets on the, put on the shoulders of students who then have their coursework to deal with. And then by the time anything might be implemented, you've already graduated. That's all intentional, I will say. It's all intentional. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but this is white supremacy. This is like how things operate, right? And 
you know, um, if there are no, you, you know, you might hire a quote unquote task force, like assemble a task force to deal with the task of equity or uh, deal with a diversity officer who actually has absolutely no kind of power to hold people accountable, right? They might like create a report or be like a, essentially like an adjunct guidance counselor for folks that have like qualms and they can just kind of absorb all of that. But there's actually no recourse for any action, right? That might be so. Yeah, it's like those are all diversionary tactics. And but I will say this: that um, uh, I think students actually have a lot more power than they realize. And what was really interesting to me was we held a couple office hours on applying to architecture schools, and a student at, who's now at Yale, who was a former student of mine, actually asked uh, asked a person that was, you know, giving the session on like what a, what a portfolio should look like, what an application looks like, what diversity measures or anti-racist measures and anti-bias measures the school, their particular institution was implementing. They really put them in the hot seat. And what I found so interesting and about that was that, and I made this comment at that session, that it is possible that maybe 19 or 18 year olds might have a different criteria for why you apply to a certain school. So instead of just looking at the top three IV, da, 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 whatever schools or whatever school you can afford to go to, that actually your metrics, just because you know some like website told you that these schools are great, your metrics for actually applying to a school as a person of color might be totally different. Knowing that you may or may not be supported, may, knowing may or may or, that may you may or may not be alienated in that experience. And, and given that you're committing a lot of money to this institution and a lot of time, of like your life essentially for what, four plus years, those aren't insignificant factors to consider. So that to me actually is really encouraging because that institutions understand tuition. And when you start withholding tuition, even alumni, right? We have actually a lot of power. When you start withholding money and, and using platforms like social media, the press, et cetera, to voice concerns, that really backs people into a corner where they can't operate according to the status quo. So anyway, sorry, that was a little bit longer than I intended, but um, I just wanted to really put that out there because it, it is actually, it is possible. But I think a lot of times because that structure is not rendered transparent, folks expend a lot of energy and get really frustrated pushing in directions that are not going to, you know, there's no, there's not going to be any kind of like any give in those particular ways because they just won't. So I think it's, you know, and I was saying maybe we should do like a office hours on student organizing to render that apparent. And I can show you where I think as someone that has been part of that system, where I would put the pressure. And that's sort of the individual conversations that I've had. But, you know, again, I'm basically I'm rendering myself completely unhirable by like having this <laughs> participating in this conversation right now. But I mean, as faculty, like I also want to see, you know, I want to see a space where students feel they can thrive and support it and labor is equitable. I mean, we, we all want those things. So I don't see why more faculty aren't speaking up, frankly. Um, thank you so much for that. Shout out to over 4,000 undergrad tuition strikers at Columbia right now. Um, Dare posed a question in the chat. Dare, do you wanna ask it or should I read it? Uh, you can go for it, Eva. Okay. Um, so Dare asked a question for Dark Matter University folks uh, regarding the salary negotiation between universities you mentioned being able to do for co-taught classes. This kind of intra-university organizing seems super promising. How did, those, how did those conversations go? What was the strategy here? Thank you for your inspiring work. Lisa, do you want to also unmute yourself? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that a lot of that was really encouraged by the institutions to have actually a space where students from Howard and Yale would be in the same space. I mean, I think that it, it also took some open minded um, institutions, but also a lot of hustling and um, kind of, you know, emails and all of that. I mean, just just trying to get and also, you know, really having those conversations and developing that pedagogy outside of the institution because of DMU and then you know, it seemed a really good time for schools to be picking up these courses just for their own sake. Um, so I think that it was, you know, it's kind of a combination of things, but. Yeah, I also would add that I think when it came to the, comes to the negotiations, it's, it's a lot of people in the room. Um, I see another, a few other people that are in DMU here. Um, 
but there have been a lot of people in the room for courses that are being taught by one or two people, but you know, there's a lot of other things happening and it's taken a lot of time for folks to kind of have the conversations and then for us to, for people, for us to even understand what it means to make a decision. And so there's just, so we've put, I think that there's been a lot of um, work behind like that, that goes into how we unlearn the institutions that we've learned from, <laughs> like how do we unlearn how to operate that way and what it is that we, how do we want to like shift the, uh, how do we want to shift like how we're thinking about what is the alternative? Like, how do we really like transform our own thinking? Because I think that's something that keeps happening in our conversations is like having to check back on what is it that we're also still embedded with us, in us, you know, what else is still in us from these, um, from these spaces that we're, we all go through. Um, but I do think when it comes to negotiation, I will, I think because I wasn't in the room for a lot of those, um, I will say though that, that that I know that it took a lot of time and a lot of a lot of conversations <laughs> for people to even come to a place that felt like um, it, it, you know the things were happening in a fair way. It's amazing how just having a WhatsApp group of like you know fifty DMU people and the transparency of being like what what salary did you get here what salary did you get here provides really, um, you know, it's like just really empowering to have that space and like from there to feel like there are other people in the room, like just to show up here and be like, there are tons of DMU people here. So, I mean, we, we have onboarding sessions. So, you know, um, come, come join us. Thank you. Uh, Camille had a question. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Um, sorry, I just turned off my video because I was hoping that I wasn't going to get emotional about it. But um, thank you so much, everyone, for holding this space. Um, I just wanted, uh, there's so many things that I wanted to touch on um, that just really hit home. I think like as soon as uh, Kristen started uh, speaking when they were talking about how uh, it really is students that kind of um, current students uh, they still experience the brunt of it that are thriving. And it's really great to um, see everyone here kind of show and really like uh, really show that there are people before us, like students have passed this point uh, and have, uh, persevered and like found really meaningful work and it's really truly inspiring and I'm I'm so sorry that I'm crying um but I just wanted to just share one story that I think just kind of gets at how like pervasive and complicated when something does play out um you know I I did a lot of student organizing I would I try to be vocal like since the summer um, there have been things that, um, you know, even on the, in terms of the strike where I haven't been paid on time and as a casual pay worker, like, you know, when you don't get that paycheck in, that really adds to the load and as a current student or first gen, low income international student, all of those things sort of compound. And, um, you know, so going for these more secure student jobs um, at the university I'm at is, you know, a bit more, it, it's a bit harder. And there was a situation where um, I was very honest about the organizing that I was doing. And I made it clear right at the beginning that this was like, this is part of who I am. And, and, and especially with where we were coming off from the summer, like I wanted to take a position that really respected um, allowing you to, to have that dissent basically of like having a different opinion. Um, but <laughs> it was really disappointing to have gone through an experience where somebody used that against you, <laughs> against you <laughs> assumed you wouldn't be able to handle it because you're busy doing other stuff that, other, that the labor of other people, like the other people aren't. I, just going back to what Jerome said about it, it falls on the students of color to, to do the work <laughs> and to, to get, <laughs> to get that from a woman of color that I looked up to <laughs> was so much worse. <laughs> And it was just so 
disappointing because the way that she framed it, even the way that she approached the conversation previously is that she's in a tenuous position as well. She's an adjunct and I, of course, this is why I like really respected and understood how difficult and precarious that position can be. <laughs> but then to not open up that space to take care of, you know, to not repeat that harm, you know, understanding that I'm sure like now that I've had time to reflect on it and move past it, like knowing that I'm sure they've had to um, act and, and work a certain way to work through these you know, white supremacist regimes that, that like, how do you get to a po point of success and power, right? So it was just, anyways, I just wanted to share it because it's such a complicated story. <laughs> and I'm glad it, you know, it didn't, I, it was passed on to another student and another student got that opportunity, but it's hard to be gaslit by the university when you're taking time outside of your own studies, your own things that you know, you don't you're not doing well as well as other students because you care so because it affects you so much and you can't succeed. So I'm so sorry for kind of really crying, but I just want to say that I really thank all of you for this work because it's after a while you just it's hard to not just collapse in and then just try to focus on why you're here and why you're trying to work so hard so that you can help other people later <laughs> and just try to get through that so anyways thank you so much for letting me share <laughs> thank, thank you. you camille we've all been there as well and that's exactly why we're here yeah I just want to echo that and also I think it's important you know you and Jimmy have both been apologizing for showing emotion but um this is emotional work like racism sexism all of it any kind of oppression is emotional and it takes a physical toll a psychological toll emotional toll on you in ways that it's hard to sometimes ex explain to folks that have had a very privileged life that have not, ex ex you know, it, you can feel it in your body. I talk about this all the time with Shumi, actually, you know, like how do you release that from your body and take care of yourself because it, you absorb a lot. And, and I also want to point out that like, I think there was a good comment in the chat about, um, you know, we need to, we're talking a lot about building new structures outside of the institution. But I also just want to acknowledge, and, you know, I don't want to speak for Lexi or Delisa, but People love to talk about office hours like it's uh, like such a wonderful initiative, it's such a wonderful thing that you've made in the world. And what I actually remind people is that I actually have have a career, <laughs> like like I'm doing this on the on the side, and it's exhausting, and it's not supported in the way that it needs to be. Um, I don't know about DMU, like in the early discussions I was part of with DMU, there wasn't, it was all extracurricular labor and it's so exhausting, right? Like we can, we, I, it's, it needs to be celebrated like DMU office, all these things need to be celebrated. But if we didn't have white supremacy as a problem, we wouldn't need to do this work. Right? Like I could spend the time in my studio doing whatever, you know, it's actually kind of a, like, I don't know, oppression is a massive distraction from your life in a way, you know what I mean? Like the life you wish you could live. And, and, and that philanthropic, and I will say this too, again, probably like rendering myself in some, whatever, but this is, this is life. You live one life uh, and you have one go, but like the philanthropic structures that we need to approach to support our work mirror the structural problems of society, right? So I will say that as well, that it's not easy work to do. So I, I, I recognize everything you're saying, Camille, and it's so important that you said that and that you shared your story because so many people have been in your shoes and they've, they've talked to me, they've talked to Shumi, they've talked to so many, you know what I mean? Like this is not an uncommon story. 
And it's a really unfair and unjust story. And it's, and, and, but I, and yeah. So I just want to acknowledge that because it's, it, it takes its toll on you really. It does physically in ways that um, it's, it's hard to explain. And, and I think that's a whole other conversation about maybe ways to manage that because um, it's in, to have that level of frustration that you have to live with is like, yeah, it's just not fair. It, all of it's not fair. Excuse me, jumping back in. I will say though that I'm perhaps maybe willfully, but I'm learning to see it as a strength too. I mean, I cry and others don't have to, but I know that they're somehow given permission to feel, no, that's wrong. And um, if it takes me crying to allow that, okay, that's, I mean, cry anyway. So I don't mind it anymore. I think people it just need means, to see it though, but like- It just means my colleagues and students know that that's allowed. And they know that when they feel like, that, and that makes me much more valuable to them and they are much more valuable to me. And if I was holding it all in, not only would I be on much higher medication, but um, they wouldn't have that. I did a poor job in facilitating in that I lost track of time and we are actually on a digital picket line that has a new teach and that started five minutes ago, but I definitely um, didn't want to interrupt any of this. So I hope that the following um, speakers um, will understand. Um, I want to give the chance um, for our speakers if they want to do a final comment, a brief one. Um, And I'm just going to echo what Shumi just said in the post and uh, the chat. Let's find ways to stay supportive of each other and pass it forward. I think that is a very good way to end this. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, to the GSAP um, students um, in the room, um, we are moving over to a Q&A about the strike in the union. Um, you should have a Zoom link, uh, message me if you don't. Um, so we'll continue talking about that in a kind of cheese up internal way. Um, thank you so much, everybody. This was um, so fantastic. I have so many thoughts and I hope um, people get in touch with each other and start talking and continue this conversation um, to create some structural change. Um, eventually through this work. Thank you.